will grace you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for today out of the book of Deuteronomy speaks this. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Again, for you are a holy to the Lord your God. For a moment, I want you to think with me about what this word holy means. When you think of something or someone who is holy, what images are drawn to your mind? Maybe you're like me, and the first thing that you think of is the front cover of a Bible, where it says, The Holy Bible. And it's inscribed on the front, and that's, if you're like me, kind of a visual person, that's the first place you go. Well, maybe your mind goes to how artists throughout the ages have portrayed something as holy. And as far as I can tell, it seems that they simply make something glow. It glows some kind of yellow gleam. It's really bright, and it blinds you, and that object is holy. We have glowing halos, a glowing chalice. It's something that just blinds you with its radiance. Maybe instead of a book or a glowing object, your idea of holiness is a location. It could be the church, God's house, as we gather together to worship him, or Maybe it's this altar area where you watch me and Pastor Derek bow as we come up and down from the altar to respect God's presence in this place. Or maybe it's the places where Jesus walked and lived. One could see those being holy. Our ideas of holiness can even fall on people. You could be an extraordinary person of history, a saint that endured all persecution, all to keep their faith. Maybe it's a monk who prays in silence or Maybe it's a person a little closer to your heart, a grandmother or grandfather or someone that's always at church, always helping out, always doing the right and proper thing. Holiness can mean different kinds of things to different people and even different things when we put our mind to it. Holiness is something that we find ourselves sometimes even chasing or something we find ourselves running away from. In our reading for today, Moses doesn't call something glowing holy. His reference to holy isn't about a location like the tabernacle or the top of Mount Sinai. He doesn't even speak it over a group of extraordinary people. In fact, his example of holy is quite underwhelming when looked at it compared to all these other thoughts we've had. Moses calls the people of Israel gathered before him holy, specifically this next generation that's come about. He calls this ragtag collection of desert wanderers holy. The people of Israel is certainly an underwhelming answer, not only because of the common nature of who these people are, but especially in light of how these people got into their current position. After being rescued from slavery, this people has been anything but faithful to their God. When circumstances led to hunger or thirst, anger arises at this God who rescued them that they would just die in the desert. When God withdraws with Moses to Mount Sinai, the people become restless, and the first thing they do is create an idol for them to worship. When 12 spies were sent into the promised land, they hear nothing but grim news and bad reports, and they don't trust that God will do what he says he will do. Not only are they common people and not special, they're also unfaithful. The people that Moses calls holy has a history of grumbling with what God provides. They have a history with idolatry and mistrust of what will happen to them despite God leading and guiding them every step of the way. As we think to things or people that we think are holy, we're taken aback by these people. Holiness draws images of faithfulness, of extraordinary feats of devotion to God. How can someone like these unfaithful people that are prone to wander be holy? As we return to our text today, we see this holiness that Moses speaks about a little more clearly. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Despite all of the sin, despite all of the evil of the people who are on the face of the earth, and especially here in God's people, Israel, it's not about the deeds that make these people holy. 
but rather about the God who bestows holiness on his people. It's a God choosing of these people that make them holy. It is God separating them and making these people his own people that make them holy. It's the actions of God that bring about holiness. So our text tells us that the people of Israel were not the greatest in number. In fact, Moses tells us they were some of the fewest. But they are holy because the Lord loves them and is keeping an oath that he swore to their fathers. He separates this people out from the world and gives to them his own presence. And he does all of this out of love for them. And we see this story of love played out as we see God's actions again and again for his people, Israel. We think all the way back and see God stretch out his mighty hand, and through signs and wonders, God redeems his people, Israel, from slavery in Egypt. With plagues, storms, and destruction, God rescues his people. And he again selects his people as holy as he parts the Red Sea, and he brings his people out of an impossible situation. And he drowns Pharaoh and his armies in the sea. God himself lived in the middle of their camp, and he led them as his chosen holy people through the desert. It was God that remained faithful to these people despite their idolatry, despite their grumbling. And for 40 years, God has remained faithful to these people he's called his own, the people he has made holy. So having seen this faithful God throughout his life, in a life that is now drawing to a close, Moses speaks to this new generation of the people of Israel. He speaks to the generation that's going to reap the promises that God has given to them. They are going into the promised land to take it. He speaks to God's chosen, separated from the rest, holy people. And Moses tells his people about the faithfulness of their God. Moses says this, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. What a wonderful image of God's love. As Moses passes the torch in one sense to this next generation, he reminds them of this God who is faithful from generation to generation to generation. Yet Moses, in a little past our reading for today, continues. And he reminds the people of the seriousness of sin. He writes this. And repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandment and the statutes and the rules that I command you today. Departing from the will of God has serious consequences for the people of Israel, as seen through their time in the desert so far. You can almost imagine Moses as a parent teaching his children by warning them of the ways that they've sinned or they've erred. Moses wants these children to be faithful, to be faithful where his generation failed. That the story of this generation and the generations that will follow it show just how ingrained sin is into the creation and how these future generations will also feel the consequences of their sin. In the coming years, this generation too will struggle with idolatry as they enter into the land. The future generations will struggle with adultery, injustice, and apathy, and they face consequences as well. They see defeats by their enemies. They see exile, and they even see death. Yet in their story, in the midst of this sin, in the midst of the consequences of sin, we see the beautiful work of God. We see God the faithful at work. Despite their sin, despite their unfaithfulness, God does not forget his promises to these future generations. God keeps his covenant and his steadfast love for his people. He rescues them from their enemies. He rescues his people from captivity, and he brings them home once again. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the people who are on the face of the earth. God is faithful. He forgives. He restores. And he makes this broken and sinful people 
his people. He makes them holy. And the story of God's faithfulness continues from generation to generation to generation as God himself comes to save his people, not from captivity or danger, but from the very sin that they're caught up in. Where once he stretched out his arm to bring plagues, to bring signs and wonders to free his people. Where he once stretched out his arm to cast Pharaoh and his army into the sea. Where he once stretched out his arm to care for his wandering people in the desert. He again stretches his arm out to save and to redeem his people. Jesus comes to his people in the flesh and stretches his arms out on the cross. Taking upon himself all of God's wrath for the sin of the world. For the times his people were not perfect. For all the times they will fail in keeping God's commandments. Christ suffers and he dies. And he rises again that his people might have life eternal. And what's more incredible is that this great story of God's redemption comes to people who are not Israelites in the flesh, who are not descendants of the desert wanderers by birth. The promises of God's redemption go forth and out of the people Israel into the whole world. To people like you and to people like me. That God would call us holy and separate us from the world to make us his own people. While we may not be of Israel by birth, our situation is no different. We too suffer with sin. We certainly do not fit the part of being holy as we might see it. Each and every one of us struggles with our own sinful nature. As Israel built golden calves to worship, we replace God with politics, wealth, or other priorities that unseat his spot in our hearts. As the people of God grumbled at what God provided for them, we find ourselves unhappy and frustrated with what God has graciously given to us. Each and every one of us has sin that we keep close to our chest, sin that if someone were to know about it would change the way that they look at us. We are far from holy. And like the people of Israel, we are sinful and broken. We suffer under the consequences of our own sin. And the good news is that the story of redemption, the story of the redemption of Israel, becomes our story as well. That God stretched his arm out against Egypt to free his people, that drowned Pharaoh and his army in the sea, that led and fed Israel in the desert. The God that died for his people on the cross outside of Jerusalem has claimed us as his people. He sets us apart as holy. It's in the joy of this great story that we await that final day where all things will be made new. Life with the whole family of God will be restored, made holy because God has chosen us because of his love for us in Jesus. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Through the death and resurrection of Christ, God has claimed us as his treasured possession. He washes away our sins in his blood, and he makes us holy. In baptism, he claims us as his own people and connects us to this Israel and includes us in this wonderful message and story of redemption for all creation. So as the new generation after Moses enters into this promised land for the first time, They'll face challenges, temptations, and seemingly impossible obstacles. But through it all, God was with them and saw them through it all. In our struggles, we know that it is God, a God who is called faithful, and he has made us his own. And it's in that hope we pray. Amen.